will finally get to talk in Home and Away today. Find out if she can bear to forgive him in half an hour after the news at noon. This lunchtime on Five News, a man is charged with attempting to hijack a plane bound for Britain. A service celebrating the lives of Holly and Jessica is to be held today at Ely Cathedral. And Michael Jackson is voted Artist of the Millennium. Hello. A man has been charged with attempting to hijack a flight bound for the UK. He was arrested after allegedly trying to board a Ryanair plane in Stockholm with a gun in his hand luggage. Swedish police said he was with a group of people on their way to an Islamic conference in Birmingham. David Harrison reports. Anti-terrorists police cleared all 189 passengers from the Stansted-bound flight. Dogs trained to detect bombs were used to search the plane at Vasteras Airport near Stockholm as detectives questioned one man, a 29-year-old of Tunisian origin. He was charged with planning to hijack the plane after security staff discovered a gun hidden in the man's hand luggage during routine x-ray checks. He'd been travelling as part of a 20-strong group heading for an Islamic conference in Birmingham. Other members of that group were questioned but later released. And after all luggage had been searched, the rest of the passengers were allowed to continue their journey. They arrived at Stansted in the early hours of this morning and spoke of their shock at this apparent hijack attempt. I wasn't quite aware that something serious was going on because there were big armed police, police force with Alsatians, um, large sort of guns and lots and lots of police. And they were searching, checking for bombs and stuff. There was a guy that had uh, a gun in his, hand, uh, in his hand luggage. So I think, well, what we think is maybe that he was uh, going to try and kidnap, uh, hijack a plane. So uh, it feels OK, it feels good that we, we've made it through. First we were, you know, allowed to board and everything, and then suddenly, you know, they said, yes, well, you have to leave, and then, you know, we saw the police with more or less machine guns and stuff like that. The incident comes as UN experts warn that Osama bin Laden's terror network is alive and well and could strike again. Just days short of the first anniversary of the September the 11th atrocities, and airport security will now be of paramount importance the world over. David Harrison, 5 News. Well, the security measures which foiled the alleged hijack attempt on the Ryanair flight were put in place after those atrocities of September the 11th. Colin Campbell is at Stansted Airport now. Colin, what more have Ryanair and the authorities been saying about this alleged hijack plot? Well, police in Sweden are try currently trying to work out if there are any links between this 29-year-old uh, suspect and any terrorist organizations. They're trying to work out if he's had any connection whatsoever with Osama bin Laden's al-Qaeda terrorist network. Uh, that a few details yeah. have come out about the 29-year-old individual. Uh, we understand at the moment that he is of the same religion as shoe bomber Richard Reid and that he does have criminal uh, convictions, but police in Sweden believe at the moment that he is a lone operator. Uh, they, are, they have questioned and released 20 other individuals. Uh, they are due to arrive back here at Stansted Airport uh, very shortly. Uh, now, the organ Organisers of an Islamic conference, who these 20 individuals and the 29-year-old suspect uh, was making his way to, are distancing themselves from the incident. Uh, the 29-year-old suspect, as the report said, is charged with planning to hijack a plane. Uh, he's also charged with the possession of a firearm. Police believe he was trying to use that weapon, trying to smuggle it on board a plane, uh, to hijack the plane with 180 passengers on board. Colin Campbell, thank you. A service is to be held at Ely Cathedral later this afternoon to honour Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. The murdered girl's parents will join police and residents of their hometown of Soham to the service, which is by invitation only. The cathedral's dean describes it as a celebration of Holly and Jessica's lives. John Gilbert is at Ely Cathedral now. John, it's not being called a memorial service, so what form will this service take? Well, we have now seen the order of service, but out of respect to the congregation and the families of the two girls, we've been requested not to discuss it in any great detail at this stage. Just suffice to say that it does indeed attempt to steer a course, if you like, between an appropriate note of grief and mourning for the lives of these two young girls, cut so tragically short, and also, as you say, a sense of celebration for their lives. In fact, the Reverend Tim Albon Jones, their local parish priest, in his address will tell the congregation but although there is a place for grief, there's also a time for celebration for their lives as they were. And I understand that some school teachers are outlining plans for the start of the new term this morning. 
That's right, yes. One of the great fears had been up until this stage that the two schools at the center of this tragedy, both St. Andrew's School, which Holly and Jessica both attended, and also the local secondary school, the Soham Village College, because they've been closed off as police crime scenes up until now, might not have been able to open in time. Now, we heard this morning from the headmaster that not only will they be opening at an appropriate moment, but also he's hoping that it will prove something of a new beginning for these traumatized children. The John first few days of term will be different as children and staff gather for the first time since these terrible events unfolded. Children and staff will be affected in different ways and we should be sensitive to the needs of individuals. And where counselling is needed, it will be provided. Security procedures, obviously, but I think we've clearly shown... A thousand guests expected here this afternoon, family, friends, school children and police officers. The general public have been respectfully asked not to attend. John Gilbert, thank you. More stories making the headlines this lunchtime. The Deputy Prime Minister, John Prescott, is expected to back plans to combat rogue shipping and illegal fishing at the Earth Summit in Johannesburg today. Mr Prescott believes that they're a danger to the future of the world's oceans. Politicians will also discuss plans to fight marine pollution and protect endangered species. The US Vice President Dick Cheney has ignored international opposition to an attack on Iraq by once again calling for the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Mr Cheney said that time was not on our side in ridding Saddam of weapons of mass destruction. He said there was little doubt that the Iraqi leaders would use them against the US and its friends and allies. Denver in the American state of Colorado has been struck by a severe storm with a weather forecaster capturing this tornado on camera. It damaged several blocks of flats which were still under construction. Emergency teams were sent to the area but there were no reports of injuries. The case against a family doctor accused of illegal trafficking in human organs was upheld this morning by a medical disciplinary committee. Dr. Baghdad Singh Makar was brought before the GMC after telling an undercover journalist it would be no problem to obtain a kidney from a live donor for a fee. Catherine Jones is at the GMC now. Catherine, um, can you just outline the GMC findings for us? Well, Dr. Baghdad Singh Makar, the GP at the centre of these allegations, said yesterday as he came here to give evidence, I would rather kill myself than indulge in the trade in human organs using living people. But today, uh, the panel of eminent doctors here at the General Medical Council have actually decided that he would be prepared to jeopardize the health, maybe even threaten the lives of poor and vulnerable people in India because he offered, so they believe, to um, pay money for one of their organs in order to be able to give it to someone in this country prepared to pay for it. And just detail the allegations against Dr. Makar. Well, it all stems from an investigation by the Sunday Times. They actually taped two conversations with the doctor, uh, a journalist posed as a man whose father desperately needed a kidney operation. And just to give you an example, here is an excerpt from one of those taped conversations uh, where the journalist is beginning to explain his father's situation. Uh, uh, basically, we need a kidney transplant. And he's, we've been told here, forget it. Waiting list. Plus Nation Health in the Nation Health in the Yeah, it's so we're going private. Yeah, I can get it done. Thank you. No problem, I can fix that for you. Yeah. You want it done here? You want it done in Germany? Or you want it done in India? India. India is India is Yeah. India is yeah. Okay. I can get it done in Bombay, Breach Candy Hospital, which is one of the best hospitals in India. So Catherine, has he now been struck off? Well, no, because although the facts of this case have been proved to the panel's um, satisfaction, they now decide whether this amounts to serious professional misconduct. In his mitigation, his lawyer has said this morning, Dr. Macker uh, was just idle, careless, face-saving talk from a tired man who didn't want to admit he didn't know the answers to the journalist's questions and that it was an isolated incident. So, as you can see, the media here are still waiting to hear uh, what the result will be. Catherine Jones, thank you for that update. The success rate of IVF clinics is improving, with some treatment centres now giving infertile couples a one in four chance of having a baby. But figures from the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority reveal a wide variation in success rates across the country. They also reveal that more women aged 38 or over are opting for IVF treatment. Joanna Longworth reports. More and more women are focusing on their careers and putting off having children until their 30s, even 40s. For them, infertility 
is a very real concern. And the hopes of many couples having problems conceiving lie in the specialist hands. Here at University College Hospital in London, 39% of women succeed in giving birth after one treatment. It's the second best rate in the country. Some might say that the, t the tables uh, might create an unhealthy uh, atmosphere of competitiveness. Uh, but in my opinion, it is a vehicle to encourage clinics to strive for excellence. And not all clinics have done so well. One only achieved 10% success. But overall, figures have improved. According to the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, the year 2000 to 2001 had 21.8% success, compared with 19.5 in 1998 to 99. The figures include the growing number of women over 38 years old using IVF. For those under 38, the success rate is better at 25%. But even for those women, that still means 75% failure. Infertility treatment is expensive. It's also extremely stressful and it's also an invasive procedure. And couples do need to think carefully before they embark on it. The improved success rate is welcome news for those worried about infertility. But it does not mean IVF treatment is a sure thing. Joanna Longworth, 5 News. We'll take a short break right now, but still ahead this lunchtime. Wacko Jacko steals the show at the MTV Video Awards. And why the critics think that the sweetest thing has all turned sour for Cameron Diaz. John Marriott has our weekly movie verdict. Plus, we'll have the day's weather prospects. That's five news after the break. This is 5 News, it's 12.13, welcome back. All this week on 5 News, we've reported on the lost innocence of children across the globe. This lunchtime, we end our series with kids back in Britain. These children are your neighbours, they attend your schools, and of all dreams of normal kids. But they're anything but normal. Unpaid, unsung, and often ignored, Mark Jordan has been to meet one of the thousands of British children growing up looking after the grown-ups. When Gemma was just seven, her mother developed multiple sclerosis and then a degenerative disease that means her bones are literally crumbling away. It's just the two of them. Now 14, Gemma's been running the household for seven years. Gemma's just one of around 32,000 children who every day across Britain is left caring for sick parents. Day in, day out, behind closed doors. Love is the driving force. Lost childhood, the price. I'm getting you to help me up in a minute. I can be up with mum all night. I'm cooking and cleaning, helping mum. Um, and then I've said to mum, you know, I'll be upstairs, going to go for a little lay, lie down. And if you want me to just go. And then the next thing I know, I'm waking up. And it's like the next morning. I feel guilty a lot of the time. She'll have an opportunity to go out and she'd rather stay in, or she said she'd, well, she'd rather stay in um, and sit with me. Um, but I know that's because she worries about me. The kitchen floor, washing up, drying up and getting away. And I've got to finish washing those clothes. The isolation takes its toll. <laughs> At one point, Gemma um, developed yeah, anorexia. Others have become suicidal. A support group is trying to shield her from school bullies who think keeping mum alive an odd pursuit. How bad is the bullying get, getting? What, um, what sort of things are happening in school? It is, it is getting worse. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, I was pushed down the stairs. As they walked past, they said, oh, how's the spastic today? There are times when a teenager not appearing for school and being up all night may well deserve punishment. But what when it's a teenager looking after her mother who's in agony? Well, that's what Gemma's been going through, and the school seem anything but supportive. They've actually taken my mum to court and prosecuted her. They've prosecuted me for truancy. Too young to receive a care estate allowance, a truant in the eyes of her school. But here at home, a lifesaver. I know that mom's going to get worse and it, it upsets me that I think I haven't got any friends so I'm not going to have anyone that's going to be there to like, that I can talk to. 
I say to her, I say, you are my life, you are, you are my all, you are my everything, like the song, you know, and she, and she says, ditto. <laughs> Mark Jordan, Hun Bay, Five News. Parents have greater powers to decide which films they want their children to see at the cinema with the scrapping of the 12 rating from today. That's the view, at least, of the British Film Classification Board, which is introducing a 12A category. It allows children under 12 to see movies such as Spider-Man, provided they're accompanied by an adult. Well, John Marriott's here for a look at this week. But first, we'll discuss uh, this move. What do you think of this decision? I think it's probably quite a good idea, really. I mean, an awful lot of 12 uh, films now are the kind of films seen by young kids at home on video. Now, if they're the kind of films which have fairly sanitised violence, like Spider-Man, or the new Bond film, which will get a 12A, I think, it's perfectly OK. It does, of course, put the onus on the parents more than before. But, it, you know, there's an, I mean, Spider-Man, I had complaints about that myself. Why can't my 10-year-old see it? But, of course, they have to be careful, because at that age, there's a difference between a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old. So parents have to be very cautious. But I think, on the whole, it's a good move. Do you think parents will, will do this now? Do you think they'll take their children under 12 to see films like Spider-Man? Yeah, I mean, of course, they've got to keep up the speed with what's going on. And, I mean, clearly they don't want their kids exposed to something very raw and violent. But most films that we're talking about here don't fall into that category. And most robust nine-year-olds could sit through Spider-Man without blushing once or without being oversensitive. OK, well, let's talk film now. Uh, Cameron Diaz's new film, it's a chick flick, the sweetest thing. What's it about? <laughs> It's also very awful, yes. This is, uh, you know, this is desperately trying to be a good film, really. It's trying to be a romantic comedy about girls finding Mr. Wright and a girls on the road movie where they go and find Mr. Wright. And Cameron Diaz and her vacuous smile are at the centre of everything. OK, let's take a clip. Look at the clip. Who's this chick? No. Oh, she is hot. No, 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 Bring no, her. No. What? Don't say no. You have so much for how. Listen, you've got to say yes, you've got to come, because let me tell you why. You're never going to find anyone better than my brother here. He is the greatest, and I am okay. sure that hurts me. Okay. That hurts me. Now, just just look at him. Chicks freak on this guy, and that's why he's Raj. in my wedding on Raj, Saturday. Raj, no. Yes. No. Just trying to help out. Yeah. Ooh, that's what passes for wit. Okay. I mean, this film's like a sort of, it's the equivalent of a talkative idiot with nothing to say. I mean, it makes so much noise because it knows it's not funny. And even set pieces that could be quite amusing are just completely wasted. Added to which, you've got, you've got Cameron Diaz and her two friends on screen prattling on about men, about clothes, um, and about parts of their body that may begin to move with old age. Um, it's very insulting to women as well, I think. So, Sex in the City, it's not then? Not even in that league. <laughs> OK, well, let's take a look at our second film then, uh, Nicolas Cage, another war epic, Second World War epic. Yeah, this is based on a true story. Several hundred Navajo Americans were assigned to the US Marines during the Second World War because they were given a secret code, the only code the Japanese couldn't break. So we've got that particular spin on a very old-fashioned World War II movie. OK, and the film's called Wind Talkers. Let's take a look at the clip now. Target reference, dog one, south, 700, elevation, zero, five, zero. I mean, Nicolas Cage has teamed up with the face-off director again, John Woo. How does this film fare, then? Well, Cage, as you might expect, sort of grunts and sweats his way through every frame, you know, very monosyllabically. That's what he does in most films, in fact. You'd expect stylish direction from John Woo, and you certainly get stylish direction. I mean, he made Mission Impossible 2, the films you mentioned. But at the centre of it, you just got yet another spin on, uh, you know, heroism, courage, self-sacrifice and redemption. It's very tired, and it feels it. Mm. OK, then. So you, you're not going for this one, then? Well, I think the predictability saps it of energy. You know, the only thing that's not old-fashioned about it is the, are the flying limbs, and there's quite a few of those. So keep all young kids and all adults away from it, I would say. OK, John Marriott, thank you very much for that. The world's music stars failed to disappoint at the MTV Video Music Awards in New York last night. Eminem was booed off the stage as he picked up four gongs. Michael Jackson gave a classically bizarre performance as he accepted the award of the millennium. And in a rare, reverent moment, everyone paid tribute to the victims of September the 11th. Dan Rivers reports. A huge street party heralded the start of this year's MTV Music Awards, bringing parts of downtown New York to a standstill. 
Singers like Pink, determined to have a good time, jostling for attention with the likes of Shakira and Australia's pop princess Kylie, who was pleasantly surprised at the rapturous reception. Just walking in, it was a little shocking. Um, so I guess everything's good, it's all happening. But one teen star upstaged them all with an outfit that looked more like a cast-off from the village people. It's so good. It's like, honestly, the energy here, I've been in L.A. for a while, and it's like, really, I love it, but I just, I don't know, I think young people need to come to New York. It's just, it's crazy. It's cool. And pop idol judge Simon Cowell was in typically sarcastic form with singer Paul Abdul. I'm paying her not to put the album out. Inside Bruce Springsteen's song about September the 11th prompted this tribute. I want to thank the music industry and specifically the artists who have supported New York City in this very, very difficult year that we've gone through. And then to the awards themselves, Michael Jackson appearing to accept his Musician of the Millennium gong. Um, this is really amazing. I can't believe it. Rapper Eminem scooped four awards, including Best Male Artist. I'm taking this home for rap, period. The mutual backslapping and revelry continued long into the night with no shortage of music to keep the party swinging. Dan Rivers, 5 News. That's all from me for now. I'll be back with a reminder of the top stories at 1. And don't forget, Katie Ledger's here at 5.30 and 7.30. Bye for now. Channel 5 Weather, sponsored by approvedcarfinance.co.uk. Hello, well not that great a day today I'm afraid with a lot of heavy rain, particularly through the north with the risk of some local flooding. The satellite shows this quite clearly, plenty of cloud across northern Britain bringing heavy rain to northern parts. So to this afternoon, well I'm afraid it's not a great picture, clearer skies though through the south and the best of the brightness will be found through the southeast with temperatures reaching highs of around 23 degrees. But the Midlands will also be prone to the odd shower as will Wales and the southwest, so rather cloudy with patchy showers there. Northern England again will see rain it'll feel breezy as well and showers are also going to move across Scotland after a rather dry start this morning so moving on to tonight well Scotland and Northern Ireland as well as the northern parts will see that rain lingering just for the first part of the evening before it dies and moves away again now the rain we've seen through Wales will push its way eastwards during the course of the evening so drier weather will follow behind so all in all quite a clear night with temperatures ranging between 9 and 15 degrees and it will feel cooler and fresher than of late in the north. More from me later, but for now, here's the summary. Heavy rain for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. Cooler and fresher in the north and the west. Approved Car Finance, sponsors of Channel 5 weather, come rain or shine.